Welcome back. Uh, my guest today is a godsend. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that openly because her topic is a topic uh, that I have been really contemplating for the last few weeks. I'll tell you why in a minute. Dr. Uh, Jody uh, Wellman is someone that moved from being a corporate executive to being an executive coach that basically focuses on, if I want to put it in two words, uh, on not wasting your life and in living life fully, in being successful, uh, but at the same time, really squeezing life out of life. And I think that truly is a topic that matters that most of us don't understand. As she holds a master's of applied positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania and uh, is a, a professionally certified coach. Her work truly comes from uh, the heart. So it reaches the heart. Uh, this is part of our mini series on stress to celebrate the publication of my next book on stressable. Uh, interestingly, most of uh, the conversations we've had on stress were how to deal with stress while one topic that I asked my team to bring together, uh, and they found Joji for that, uh, is the is the idea that when you are alive, you are less stressed. When you really enjoy life, uh, you become less uh, stressed. So uh, remember, as I always say, that uh, Unstressable is a mission. Uh, it wants to reach a million people and get them out of stress every year. Uh, and if you want me, uh, if you want to help me with that, uh, I ask you to uh, help me navigate the publishing industry because the publishing industry is all about how many books are sold within a specific week, which is normally the first week of launch. So if you're intending to buy Unstressable, please order it as soon as you listen to, to this so that when it comes out, it actually ha hits the bestseller list and that gives, us a, gives it a chance to get to more people. Uh, if you do order it, uh, please go to our website, unstressable.com and register for our um, publication webinar where Alice and myself will be talking about uh, all of the different concepts of Unstressable, but also taking your questions. It will be a wonderful evening on April 28th. Without further ado, uh, Dr. Uh, Jody uh, Wellman. Jody, I am oh. really grateful. Oh, oh, I am grateful right back at you, a reverberation of gratitude uh, for being here to get to chat with you. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is a topic uh, that is really on my mind recently. I'll tell you why. Uh, because of the concept that you teach, I have around a thousand Mondays left. And uh, I have more interestingly, uh, somewhere around 250 Mondays, uh, where I have the kind of energy that I have right now. Okay. Uh, and so when I really uh, started to think about this uh, recently, I fell madly in love uh, around um, four months ago, five months ago, and she's changed my life in many, many ways. I am the kind of guy that is really, truly living for a purpose, uh, but that works 14 hour days. And, uh, you know, my purpose gives me a lot of joy. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, I rarely ever give myself the chance to live. There you go. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say anything else. The rest of the podcast is yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, we might need you to say a couple things, but I am blown away by a couple things that you've said. One is that you've done the math, which already, you know, um, is endearing to me that you've counted how many Mondays you have left, which is the whole, f the whole point. I think it's like, we, we don't light up and turn on to life unless we really do, unfortunately get clear that it's limited. So you know you have a thousand. And can I ask you, because you said that very fascinating thing about 250, the energy you want. Can I ask about that? I'm 57. Oh, did I say that in public? Yes, I am 57. And uh, and yeah, I am uh, definitely in my late 50s. I feel like in, I'm in my early 40s, but I can definitely see that I'm not going to be able to jump on a plane every other day like I did, you know, in the last 30 years of my life. I'm I'm not going to be able to uh, keep my absolute focus to write eight hours straight. Mm. Uh, it seems mm -hmm. to me that if I am to actually enjoy experiences in life, I might as well do them with a fully abled body uh, in my 50s than uh, a slightly less abled body in my 70s and uh, 60s, you know. And 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 if you if you count and say that, um, you know, we are not the same every decade, uh, then I would probably say that by my, my mid 60s, uh, I can expect that I'll be able to do a little less than what I can do right now. And so between now and then that gives me 250, 350 maximum Mondays to, to pull okay. it. 
I love this so much that I am just about ready to burst because it's more like you're highlighting. It's more than just counting until the end, which I do think is actually a risk that we experience sometimes yeah. is that many of us do this thing where we postpone our existence, right? So we have a this notion, I have all these dreams, it could be on a bucket list, or it could just be out of thin air, but things we think we want to do, dreams, hopes, desires, and we do this thing where we say, I'll do it later. For many of us, that's code for, you know, retirement, whatever that is going to mean for us. Yeah. And what you're talking about is, you know, I like to say, let's just look at life in a granular way about how many Mondays do we have left, but they're not all created equal. And you've exactly. highlighted that so beautifully, right? Is that the ones near the end, we ain't going to have as much vim and vinegar. And we need to be able to fly up the Spanish steps if that's where you want to go visit or do all the things you long to do. And so you're prioritizing and saying, if I've got 250, now I've got to tell you, falling in love is probably going to buy you a little more energy. And so that sounds like oh, a delicious yeah. part of this next chapter of oh, life yeah. for you. Um, but but by, by prioritizing, right? And saying if you've got a thousand in total, and let's be honest, we all know it's plus or minus, right? Mm -hmm. You could outlive that. You could underlive that. We can. don't know. Yeah. Right, right. But what you're saying is if there's 250, my theory and my research is that that's the thing that sharpens for most of us that, oh, now that time is scarce. What do I want to do with it? And yeah. that usually helps put a fine point on the on the life we want to live within that precious, precious time, right? 100%. I mean, the, the, the real question is, uh, which is, probably the part where you can help me most is that I have lived a very rewarding life. I've, I've had an incredible career. I had love in my life. I had a wonderful family. Uh, you know, I, I faced challenges and I overcame them and I learned in the process. Uh, in going through it all, there is a very big difference between myself and some of my dear friends who just enjoyed the f out of it. Where does that difference come from? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, I know, are aware uh, in the well-being world, the, in the science of happiness, about the two different dimensions of well-being and happiness, right? So this is way I, the way I talk about it, um, and I'm going to use the language instead of, um, we talk about longevity, we want to live long, but I also say we want to live wide and deep. And so living wide, as I relate to, with vitality, that's the traditional happiness, that is what science uh, psychological science, at least, talks about as the hedonic dimension of well-being and happiness. It's the fun, it's the froth, it's the fizz, it's the it's all the tasting menus, and it's the the trips and the yachts if you can afford it. it doesn't have to be full of dough, but you know it's easier <laughs> to talk about that way. Uh, and then that is just pure pleasure. Love it. We need it. And then there's the other dimension, which is living deeper with meaning, and that is known in the well-being world as the eudaimonic dimension of well-being. And that has a little more, let's be honest, a little more substance, where it's more about doing good in the world. It's about having um, access to um, maybe being in touch with something that's bigger than ourselves, having purpose, which you're very purpose-driven, having a connections with other people, more in touch with our character strengths and, and truly our virtues. So this is, if you think about life as... And my, my, my recommendation is let's think about widening it as much as we can and deepening it as much as we can, because that's that interplay where I do believe that most of us feel rich, is that some people skew. Some people have different needs and intentions in life. And so you're talking about people who have gone out there and just like partied it up. And now can I ask you a question? Is your perception that amidst no, all of their width... Not at all. So it's, it's, it's not about the party. It's about, about the joy of every flavor. So, so, so it's, it's quite an interesting thing. I know maybe I, 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 uh, you know, I'm very specific here, but it is, um, you know, I, I'm not the kind of guy that will go to Paris and then walk around to observe and watch things like, yeah, they don't really interest me. Okay. I, you know, I'm, I am, I eat very simple to be very honest. I'm not the kind of guy that will go and try to find the five-star Michelin restaurant because in my taste palate, it, it honestly is sometimes worse than, uh, you know, a street food cart. Okay. And, <laughs> and, uh, you know, but it is about those moments where you sit and savor and, and my, my, ben my benchmark, believe it or not, and I know it sounds really weird when we're talking about enjoying life, is I do my silent retreat 40 days of every year, 
right? And you know, I I don't I don't do it in a very monastic you know ritualistic way. I I just find forty days where I switch my devices off most of the day, other than forty minutes, and I just disconnect, right? And and that to me. Uh, within a few days zones me into pure joy. I, I start to, to enjoy everything, every flower, every uh, a butterfly, every smell, every sip of coffee, every uh, you know uh, walk, hike, whatever that is. And, and it is not the typical of any of us really uh, to enjoy that through our day-to-day -day life, is it? Mm -hmm. You were right, it is not. So we either move too fast or we're wired in a way where we're not tuned into noticing or, you know, the very simple term I've just called paying attention. And yeah. you found a way, it sounds like doing it in a super intentional, concentrated way where you are doing the unplug to start to notice. Because in the absence of all the stimulation, you know, like uh, that's when you start to notice the caterpillar, right? That normally you wouldn't have because you would have, yeah. quite frankly, stepped on it while you were looking at your phone. You found a way and you also, it sounds like, starting to kind of say like, I don't savor life typically the way other people might, like you started to talk about someone else might go and do every single thing in Paris or try every single baguette and piece of cheese. And you're like, I'm actually quite happy over here. I yeah. love you've made this point because there is no single prescription, of course, for what makes a life worth living. And I think we have to just be honest with ourselves at the end of the day and say, we can't compare our lives to one another, even though social media desperately wants us to do that. And we might be inclined to do it for a bit. But at the end of the day, when it's just you and you, and you're looking and thinking, do I feel that sense of joy and contentment, regardless of how simple my life is? Yeah. Or how many bells and whistles I have stuffed it with, because that just feels important to me. And at the end of the day, there's a feeling of that niggling, I call it, like that longing of like, I think that there's maybe more that I know I could be engaging more, or I know I need to slow down more and pay attention to the birds, or I know we have that sense. And so I think that all we can do is just be relative to, it's all relative to ourselves and what our own criteria and definition of joy is, right? So if you're not doing your 40 days, are you, are you going about your days? How do you feel a typical day is of savoring or not savoring? I, I love how this podcast always turns into my therapy sessions. My my days are very, very rich and, and, and enriching in many ways. But you see, the thing is that when you overfill your, fill your days, and I think we all do, it's not just me. When you overfill your days, you're, you're mostly running through the motions, right? If you, if I, if I, you noticed we've booked 90 minutes for this conversation. Most podcasts will, will book uh, an hour and then, you know, and then rush through it and try to finish in 40 because people's attention span. That that to me is not the way it is. This, you know, the idea of slowing down and really, really, uh, um, who knows where we will go with this, right? Mm. It, and and mm -hmm. there is tremendous joy to not feeling the pressure of time. There is tremendous joy on, in connecting to a person that I meet for the first time. There is tremendous joy to exchange knowledge and, and you know, and, and alignments on life and so on. And, and so th there is, when I allow the set myself the time for that, of course, there is a ton of joy that comes in. But, you know, when it comes to uh, filming, for example, you know, content, uh, it will be four hours, it will be ta 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 ta, -ta yeah, right? And because I have another thing that will take six hours and another thing that will take four hours and so on and so forth. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you just made me think about... you. <laughs> Because a lot of our lives, it's it's not as glamorous as I think I'd like for it to sound, you know, is that really great lives don't happen to us. We have to schedule them. It's just kind of what we're talking about is our schedule yes. and what we're trying to pack into a day. And you've described something to me, this notion about having breathing room. And I'm going to make it like the biggest metaphor of all, of course, is like, we want to stay alive here, right? Like we want to enjoy our lives. We want to be breathing versus the, the opposite, which is dead and uh, maybe in the ground, not breathing anymore. So to what extent are we building in buffers to be able to say, I'm going to give a little bit of leeway between these things, you know, or dare we say in our hyperactive, productive world that I love productivity. I suffer from this one big times. So I want to do too much yeah. in a day. And then there isn't enough time to do the simple, sweet pause and enjoy in the in-between. And so maybe we need to compromise with trying to stuff, stuff a lot into get this, the, the fleeting feel good of, look at all that I did today. 
But tomorrow morning, you're right back up against the start of it again. And that's not as sustainable for most of us as it is to elicit some of the other pleasures, right? Which is what you've started to talk about, savoring. I'm guessing that your life must have been a bit of that in the corporate world. So so when when you were, you know, a business executive or a, a corporate executive, you you basically were running in that. Uh, and and there must have been a point where you said, I, I don't want this. This is not what I'm looking yeah. for. Mo most people don't find that point. How did you find it? Yeah. Well, for me, it was uh, boredom in a framework of insanity. You know how <laughs> both can exist at the same time, <laughs> right? Like boredom doesn't have to mean I have nothing to do today at, my, at work or in my life. It was... I have a lot to do that is, yeah. <laughs> that I just don't really love anymore. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and so it's like I kind of been there, done that. And for those of us who really enjoy learning and growing and doing something different, like you and like most of the people that listen to your podcast, we know it's that's our oxygen. It's like if you're not green and growing, then you're ripe and or you're ripe and rotting, right? So for me, it was that I've 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 kind of been here, done that. Now I will be honest, I struggled mightily with finding the next thing. I couldn't figure out what to do. I was afraid. I felt stuck and it was sort of a self-imposed situation because I felt like I don't want to leave the trappings of success. And so I, I kind of floundered in a shallow water for a while while I tried to figure out what it was that I wanted to do next in my post, you know, corporate existence. Mm. Uh, so I don't, I, I always <laughs> like to point out like it was not easy. Transitions are not easy because they're usually scary, right? We're usually at risk of you know, I think that there's something so good over there. In fact, deep down, I think we all know that there's something really great over there if you take the risk. But wow, for those of us that do appreciate a comfort zone, that's a that's a tough hill to climb. It's it's not it's not just a comfort zone. I think for for many of us, it's a, it's, a, it's almost a survival story. Like you know, what I I have to do ev this every day for the rest of my life. Otherwise, how can I make ends meet? Right. R right. Right when it's remarkable how we overlook how resourceful we can be and how creative we can be. Uh, and I, I have a budding theory with more research I'm doing around this idea about how we, you know, defer our lives and want to push stuff off till later because we're so busy. By the same token, we are afraid to make changes in our lives because sometimes we will resort to the truth, which is I've got mortgages to pay. I don't want to disrupt I don't want to, you know, and so, for example, this is in the context of changing a career, which is really a really common situation we find ourselves in, right, in a lackluster job. I think um, it's less about the practical nature, about being busy or about making sure I pay the mortgage. I think it's the deep-seated, even scarier cavity inside us, which is the, I'm afraid to essentially plug into life because I, I'm afraid of what this yes. might mean for me. Yeah. Keep, right? keep, keep going you know. on that. Keep going. You, this one. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the fear. And there's, I mean, this goes back in ancient history and, and uh, philosophers have talked about this and uh, authors have written about it. Like they're, you know, the, <laughs> the, nothing really rivals the fear of death other than the fear of living. Like we are chicken shit. I, I, I mean, I get this. I relate firsthand. This we have things we want to do, but there's so much more at stake outside homeostasis because it means maybe our identity might change. And even the even bigger fear is what if I go do the thing? What if I do go back to school to be a veterinary assistant? And then I go and I do that and I'm still not happy. Mm -hmm. What will I do then? You know, um, or what if I do fail, fail fabulous? What if I do? Um, but of course, sometimes it is about ego, right? Like, I don't want to start at the bottom of the totem pole again. Hmm. But what, what if I give you a chance, a real shot at, at actual back to the idea about living wider and deeper? What if that really did give you a shot, even if it did maybe mean a bit less money or a bit less esteem because your business card doesn't say a bunch of letters or, you know, uh, you're not at a certain height on the totem pole of the org chart, right? Um, we're afraid. And we're so it's it, you know our capacity to settle is astounding, mm. and I, I I say that not judgy, I say that looking inward too, you know we're we're just I mean we're we're super scared to live, which is why I like to just more than just poke us in the ribs, I like to kick people in the butt and be like, dude, time's ticking, let's do this math again, let's yeah. do this because we do have this romantic sort of fanciful notion, magical thinking, like I'm going to get my shit together later. 
you know, or I'm going to get more courage later. Or I said, Ooh, even better. I've been there. And tell me about you. This is good. A situation will happen to me that will be good, that will help get me out of the situation. You know, it'll help th- shake things up for me. And eh, it might, but sometimes the thing that happens to you is actually not careful what you wish for. You don't want your company to go belly up, or you don't want the divorce to happen, or you don't want the things that happen. Um, but getting the getting the gumption together to say, I think that it's better beyond this sort of settling, tolerating, you know, land of this is okay enough. That that takes hard work. And I think it's only when we do stop and say, holy crap, we're finite. Time's ticking. Do you really want it to be like this for the next thousand Mondays? Of course not. There's so much more in store for you. So now let's use that and catapult into maybe a little bit of action, even if it's scary. Okay, so uh, I'm going to repeat what you t- you said. Uh, nothing rivals the fear of death like the fear of living. I think this is going to be one of the uh, forever kept slogans in slow-mo. Uh, it's so interesting when you really think about it. So clearly, you're not like the rest of us. Okay, so so I'm going to ask you to to dig deep within and tell you which brain malfunction you have that is enabling <laughs> you to to <laughs> to behave in ways that most of us I'm 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 like you by the way I don't give a shit it it is my biggest strength okay uh, and I'll come back and tell you how this works for me you know what, what it is not the reason why I don't live it it, it is the reason why I do so many projects, right? I, I start so many things. I follow so many passions, okay? And in, as, you, as you're talking, I'm, I'm, I discover more and more in my mind that there's absolutely probably the biggest joy ever in those passions, right? So yes, I, I, don't, I don't go to the five-star restaurant, but come on, the book is out in a month and a half and it will hopefully reach a million people. And, you know, you, you, can, you can easily see that there is incredible joy in all of this. However, you either were always born like this, where you're like, uh, or maybe not, because you made it through the corporate ladder, uh, but there is something in your tone that basically says, I am so hungry to live, you're not going to bog me down. <laughs> yeah, the hunger is there. You're totally right. And by the way, I'd like to thank you for complimenting me by saying what malfunction in my brain, like it was a singular versus multiple malfunctions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I feel very flattered. It's just one. No, there, there's, more, there's more than one malfunction. But um, Well, I come, by, uh, I, I come by optimism, honestly. So I do have a genuine belief in a hope for a better future. Uh, yeah. I just genuinely have that sense. And I recognize that, you know, based in science, we skew one way or another and it's hereditary, et cetera, largely. So thankfully, you know, my tendency is to see the glass half full. Um, however, um, we're still going to die. So that sucks. And that's just an unfortunate reality that, you know, we contend with. And I, uh, I, my mom died in her late fifties. So she died technically prematurely, right? Anybody dying in their late fifties, that, that, that math does not compute. But as I've really come to reflect, it was not the grief of, of losing her, uh, not to sound callous. Um, you know, I love her, miss her, but it was really this riveting moment for me of recognizing when she died, that she died with a crap ton of regrets. Mm. She died with, uh, an entire, like cabinets full and drawers full and files full and um, ideas, dreams, manuscripts, business ideas that she wanted to execute and didn't have the courage. Yeah, she also didn't have the money, but it was mostly that she just was too chicken to take action. And I know she died wishing she had done many, many things that she just didn't take action on. And it woke me up in a way that was startling because you know, like most things that irritate us in other people or that really grip us, it's because we're afraid of it in ourselves. You know, so I, I saw in that moment, I thought, oh, am I going to go down this path? I'm like, I don't smoke a pack a day. So I doubt I will die when I am 58. That, that I think I'm going to, I'm going to nip that in the bud. But I, if I continue down the path I'm on, I might also die with a bunch of coulda, shoulda, wouldas. And that is my greatest fear. And it's not just for me, it's for the rest of us. I don't, I, I, I want so fervently for us to just wake 
walk up to life and say, this is not the dress rehearsal. We don't have to get to the end and have a bunch of things that were kind of oh, feeling down on ourselves that we didn't do because like, this is going to sound super cheesy and metaphoric, but like, like the, the world's our oyster. It's all here for us. What are we waiting for? Yeah. Okay. We're afraid. That's okay. But what if we just did it anyway? Or what if we all just agreed to do one thing at a time, right? You know, and did it. I want to avoid regrets for me and for the rest of us. That just it's, it's so preventable. So, so, so it's not, it's not that you don't have the fear. It's the opposite. See that you have the optimism that if you live fully, you're going to end up in a place that's better than if you don't. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I think, um, while we'll never have the time to do all the things we long to do. So as if we're remotely self-actualized, we're all hoping and longing to keep doing more. Mm. Right. Um, I think that's inevitable, but I think one could argue who cares if you get to the end and you have regrets. I mean, one could argue the next day after you die, you're dead. You're not going to really be worried about much. Just curious. Uh, what is, what's your view of death? Do you get, uh, do you reset and get another, t uh, 2000? How, how many do we get Mondays? 4,000. 4,000. Yeah. Do, you get 4,000 in total. Do you reset and yeah. get another 4,000 that's reincarnation or do you get an eternity like, uh, uh, infinity Mondays in heaven or hell, or do you vanish and get nothing? What's your view? Yeah. My current view is, uh, vanish. Oh, is it? And it would be it would, it would be delightful if I got to come back as previously discussed caterpillar, or if there was an afterlife. And by the way, that is all according in death studies. Those are really great. In addition to being very deeply rooted, you know, religious and cultural beliefs, um, this sort of symbolic this immortality is the thing that helps many people sleep at night beyond existential despair. Right? It's that okay. What did you call it? The 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 fear of death is you have a term for it. Well. Symbolic immortality is a little trick we play on, in our brains. Mm. It's this it's this way we help to feel better about the fact we're not going to be around forever. So we often do things like, uh, well, we have kids because that helps us to feel like, well, my body will be done, but at least my kids will move on beyond me. Or we write books <laughs> and say, you know, all those books people but are going to maybe read them <laughs> in years. Yeah. But I'm not putting anybody down. This is like, these are great. We, we, we create art or we start a company that believe that, that it's not always conscious that I will do this so that I will feel better about my anxiety about, you know, being temporary. Um, but it's in there and it's not even that deep. It's sort of just like scratch the surface. And we create little projects that help us to feel like, feel better about not being around long. And um, religion is an example for many of us where we feel like, okay, well, at least many people do believe that they'll live in an afterlife. And there's just a little bit of a, oh, it's like a little landing pad that feels a little bit better about dying. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I tend to be, of course, uh, very convinced that we're not just made of our bodies, that when this body dies, our consciousness does something else, whatever that is. My my uh, my belief started, of course, from studying all of the spiritual teachings, but then got anchored in video games. Uh, I'm absolutely certain there is either another level or another game, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but but it is you know because because you have to imagine that just like in the video game, you're the player, but the character on the screen, the avatar, is not you. Uh, there is something that is the actual player of this physical avatar that is not you. Having said that, interestingly, um, why would it matter? W you know, I, I, you know, this is one of those questions that I call compartment two. You'll never know the answer to it's. It's not compartment one. It's not yes, I know for a fact that this is the answer, or no, I know for a fact that this is not the answer. There is no way you can prove the answer, but more interestingly, it's an irrelevant question because you still come to this level of the game with 4,000 Mondays. So what are you going to do with them? Right, right. And this is such a great question, great, great point, because we're, um, we're not here to talk about how we will evaluate our life at the end or how others will evaluate our lives, because sometimes we care about that too. This now takes the whole conversation back to talking about death and thinking about death and really getting in touch with it and counting the time is all in service of living better today yeah, and tomorrow. And so the lives we're living, your, your goal to make the happiness of spread around the world, our desire to, 
to some days just have a, just like, like our lives, let alone love them. And to live, most of us have this longing to do our lives justice in some way. And so it's about, it's in service of activating and living with more life now. So that sure, by the end, and hopefully it's in so many Mondays, you can't see them down the road. When we get to the end, we can say, you know what, I killed it. And that might be nice. But again, I, I, it's less about how we're gonna how we're gonna talk about it later. Um, it's more about how we're gonna live now, so that we avoid the anxiety. Because there's phenomenal research out there that talks about how our fear of death, our anxiety about it, can be mitigated if we believe that we've really shown up and lived our lives. So it's the fear right. of a life left unlived that makes us feel sometimes like, oh, I don't want to get to the end because I haven't really done it yet. Correct. I, 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 you know, actually on, on the topic of stress, which we started with, uh, the, the, the fact that you may have a stressful week, which shouldn't be every week, by the way, uh, followed by a wonderful weekend of connection and good times and, you know, something that you really enjoy makes the next week easier, right? If you, if you, if you get, a, a, you know, a stressful week, a stressful weekend, and then another stressful week, you're really, really get it, heading yourself to the hospital very quickly, right? And, and it is, it is that I idea of how can you inject joy in your life, even if sometimes life will deal you a hand that is not very comfortable, how do you inject that joy into your life? Yes. I have so many opinions about this. And I, I know based on what let's you have all of them. <laughs> uh, talked about and written them, let's do it. <laughs> so I, I immediately feel defensive and I'll tell you why. Mm. I use words like we want to live an astonishing life. I talk about the astonishingly alive life and, uh, you know, uh, it's a pretty grandiose word. And I don't want to sell anybody short. So I'm like, do not stop at the, at the good life. Like, let's just keep going. But I also want to be really clear that it doesn't, just like how you beautifully demonstrated earlier, your fabulous meal is off the street cart. Whereas someone else might be going to the, you know, Michelin starred restaurant. I don't care what your version of joy is. It's about prescriptively and judiciously and like sprinkling it into life, whatever that is for you. So I want to be really clear that it's not about living a life that looks good on Instagram or that mm -hmm. is comparing to the Joneses or you feel uh, one woman at a workshop recently, she was sort of, she was, you could tell she was sort of up in a knot in her head. And she's like, I, I just like simple stuff. Like, I don't know if I really want to get out and do what, cause her colleagues were all talking about how they were going to do a half marathon. And then this guy was going to go and do some sort of a weird climbing expedition and all these things that were, and it wasn't just physical. And she's like, I, I think I like the simpler life. And first of all, I gave her a high five. Cause I'm like, yeah, right here. Me too. I like, I like the <laughs> interspersement of some fun stuff, but I'm like, oh, honey, bunny, like I want a nice slow Friday night, you know? And it, so regardless of what it is that, that does it for you, my first question is this, do you know with clarity what brings you joy and what makes you happy? What makes you feel just that, that little tiny tingly bit about being alive? And in the work I do, it's, it's never not astounding to me that most of us are kind of out of touch with it. Like if you right now had to write out a list of 30 things that bring you sort of just like joy, and most of them have to be attainable. So you can't say something large and uncharged, like, um, you know, going on an Antarctic no. cruise, you know, no do that. Privacy. But exactly. <laughs> Let's just be like a little more attainable here. Um, many people are really stumped. And then, and then, okay, well, wait, what do, what do I really like to do? Like, to be super honest, a lot of the women that I've worked with over the years, they're just, they don't even know the simple things like what their favorite color is. And I, I'm not even joking, right? It says you lose wow. touch and that's fine. We're not here to lament that we've lost touch. Let's just, what can we do today moving forward? It's, let's just get back in touch with it. And this is why workshops are so cool. Cause you know, one person says, oh, you know, this might sound silly, but everybody has to couch it, right? Oh, this, I don't know, I don't know why this is stupid, but no, it's all amazing. It's mm. all life, it's great. Someone's go, I, I love, I don't know. I just love taking my coffee and standing outside on my porch and just looking at the wind move the trees. And then sometimes I see a bird and I don't know. I just love starting my day like that. And I'm like, write it down. That's <laughs> perfect. And so little tiny things, you know, like I like browsing through a bookstore. Oh my gosh. Oh, like, do you? Do, oh, died and go to heaven. 
And <laughs> so as an example, you know, so little things that are, some things take four minutes, something like for me to get to the bookstore and back, that's, that's going to be, you know, an hour. And so being clear with having a nice, juicy, long list of stuff that you love to do. Okay, we, we're, we're going to come to your list. We're, we're going to come to your list right now. One of my biggest joys is to go to a bookstore, pick five books, go have a coffee, browse through them as I sip the coffee slowly. Normally it's crappy coffee in bookstores, but that's okay, right? And and then and then you put them back, but one, and just hold it lovingly, go to the cashier and take it home with you. You know that feeling, right? Oh, I feel it, I feel yeah. it, yes. Right? Yes. Oh, that's, oh. And, and it's so attainable, right? And it is so, uh, um, you know, there is some kind of a similar activity for every single one of us. Some people will, right, will want to watch an old movie. Some people will want to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, walk uh, with a friend and chat. Some people will just want to listen to a slow mo podcast. Good people. Yeah. We want. We like. Those yeah. The, but, but, yeah. Yeah. They they pass the test. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 that's the whole idea. It is not winning the Nobel Prize or buying a Ferrari, is it? It is not. And so research is clear. You've talked about this before. You you fell years ago into a, a trap of purchasing that didn't quite feel like much. The hedonic treadmill, you know, is a real phenomenon in psychology research about how the things that we think are going to make us happy, it's often purchases, it's often sort of extrinsic stuff, but, you know, it might be that, oh, you know what, if I move, if I move to that city, then I'm going to be happy. Mm -hmm. And then, or if I get that car or, oh, if I find that right person, or, you know, if I get a boob job or if like something's going to just stick and we go and we do it and it feels really good for a minute. And then it does fade because that's what's called hedonic adaptation is that we naturally evolutionarily come by it honestly adapt. Now the good news of course, is we adapt the shit stuff too, you know, so mm -hmm. we can rely, we can pretty reliably come back to like some kind of a baseline. Um, but that's why the slow drip, consistent feeding the soul of those little things that do light us up. It's proven over time to deliver more of a well-being hit uh, than just a one big thing, you know, like the one big cruise you might go on a year. A lot of people live for their vacation and they go on a vacation and they may or may not have a good time. I mean, research is also fascinating that we often anticipate the trip and we get more joy out of the buildup. Which is which is lovely. Um, so definitely plan a trip in the long term horizon so you can really wring out the joy from what might come. Um, but are we living little tiny bits and doses today? And we underestimate the impact of those tiny little sweet little simple little things that are often, quite frankly, pretty cheap too. And I love that that yeah. from just a financial aspect, we're not. You don't have to go to the Mediterranean. I mean. Please do that too. <laughs> go, go, go ahead. Let's make this uh, podcast, uh, uh, you know, t let's take a segment and just marvel at all of the wonderful, beautiful, simple things that we enjoy. You you say one, oh. I'll say one. Oh, okay. For me, my breakfast, it's like a religious experience. I love mixing my yogurt with my special granola and I sit and I open up the New York Times and that to me is just a joyful experience. You go. Coffee, who who has breakfast? The, the breakfast is a, <laughs> breakfast comes later. You wake up, you reflect on a cup of coffee. You you actually find out exactly how you feel inside. Should it be creamy? Should it be short? Should it be tall? Should it be right? And then and then you make the perfect coffee. And if it's not the right coffee, you throw it away. Make another one. That oh, I think oh, is a very joyful oh, experience. I love that. Can I just um, before we go back and forth? I got a little insert, mm -hmm. a little anecdote. Someone I know told me a story of someone, his dear friend who's dying, and he's only got about a month or two left. And in his very finite existence, where for him this idea called mortality salience is super salient, he sits and his coffee is everything. And he sits and he looks at the coffee mug and he analyzes it in ways the rest of us are just zooming through the motions, right? Mm -hmm. Sounds like you're in tune with experiencing the flavor oh, yeah. and the experience of it. Um, but imagine if you knew you had two months left to live, uh, that in essence is part of the spirit of what I love to quite frankly preach for us, right? Is that it's that notion of like, again, yeah, like imagine if we knew we were going to die. Imagine that fanciful, crazy notion. <laughs> uh, that's the thing that might help us save for the coffee and save for the yogurt. Um, and what about uh, pets? I mean, let's be honest. For me, a simple joy is picking up Andy, our cat, 
and um, being with him and smelling his head and feeling his body and just being with him. That's joy. Uh, uh, Jody, I apologize. You're a cat person. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to comment on this. I really am. Do, you know, should we, do we need to stop the podcast now? I mean, my, over. Daughter, my daughter is a cat person and I love my daughter to bits, but you know, you have to understand that if you really zoom out a little bit, she works for her cats. It's not the other way around. The one that's enjoying the experience is the cat, not you. Anyway, okay, I mean, wait, well, yeah, 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 you're right. And then that's also joy because if I know that I'm making Andy happy and that makes me happy, it's a win-win situation. Do you, do you actually call him Andy or master Andy? Like you, you, you know, <laughs> you should, you should uh, yeah. Yeah. What, what was that meme? Uh, dogs have owners and cats have butlers. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, and I'm a great butler. Yeah. I, th I think I might have lost half of my podcast followers right now, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I'm not much better. I have my fish tanks and I am, yeah, I am quite a, um, yeah, I'm very, uh, uh, particular about uh, the quality of the, it's not just for the beauty of it. I try to replicate nature uh, in, uh, in, an, in an indoors environment. So of course, after I ended up my fancy lifestyle, I, uh, I, I now live in a lovely, beautiful, beautiful apartment, but not a, you know, a fancy thing. And, you know, I don't believe you need a dining table. I don't believe you need a living room. So I have my, that space, I, I have trees and fish tanks and that's all you can see around you and it's just part of nature and, and it's not it's not uh, distasteful it's actually really beautiful to wake up in the morning and have this little little weird trick even though in dubai you do get the birds outside in the morning but i ask alexa to play bird sounds at 7 a.m and so you <laughs> so you walk in there and it's uh it is yeah it's in nature i love nature Oh, nature. Some countries are doctors are issuing nature prescriptions. Have you heard of that? Oh, no. I need yeah, a, I need yeah one like of those, 20 yeah. minutes. Yes. <laughs> you need an actual, like 20 minutes outside. And the science is so phenomenal. Even 20 minutes in a green space can restore a sense of well being. Obviously, heart rate, blood pressure um, decreases. It's the physiological, but mostly the psychological benefits are profound. Um, unless you're an indoor cat, and in which case, <laughs> you know, some of us will. Uh, yeah. <laughs> get our nature hit in different ways. But um, well, you're highlighting the, again, sometimes the the seeming simplicity that's accessible for us, right? Uh, it, most it of us really could is. ask Alexa to play anything, even if it's, you're reminding me of a, another woman at a keynote I did where she was very clear. She said, one of the best things I've done to spice up my mornings now is I made the best playlist of all time. And it's music. all my music from 100%. high school that I love. And 100%. she's like, I just love getting ready in the morning to Duran Duran or whatever floats her boat. And she's just a happier person. And it's listening like 12 minutes of that. It's a choice we have. And it always astounds me that, and I always use this example in my mind about like a, like a lunch break. Most of us will say, what is a lunch break? What is this you speak of? Mm -hmm. But if you're going to wolf down food, you have a choice even for just 15 minutes, right? My inclination is to do this stupid thing, which is to just check emails. And I, wow. as, because I've already mentioned, I have a problem. I love to be productive. And part of that is just this weird notion about inbox zero, which is never zero, but close. And when I am smart enough and I practice the things I preach and I wake up and I go, oh, hi, bunny. Like you might actually like something different than answering emails. They'll still be there waiting for you. And I will then course correct and do something different like go and sit outside and bring a fiction book and sit outside while I scarf my food back still. But at least I'm having a different <laughs> experience of being alive. That again, is the very thing that helps you to then go into the next meeting or the next conversation or the next 20 minute increment of your life in a little bit of a different mental space. And that's all we're doing is going from one 20 minutes to the next. So why not make this 20 minutes just a little bit better? 100%, I'm all with you. I mean, just just a, a piece of information on safety of email. Uh, I My target is normally uh, email 22,000 unopened emails. I, again, I don't care. <laughs> I really, I don't. And I, 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 when it comes to zero, just think about that. I have 170 unopened WhatsApp uh, conversations at any point in time. 
right? And I'm unfazed by them. A couple of days ago, my phone broke, so I lost all of them. I have 170 conversations. I know I do not know uh, what they were or who they were from or what they wanted from me. They're probably going to message again. Life will be fine. Can I ask you a question? Because you're mm. highlighting something from the research that I'm just fabulously in love with. And it's people who have had near-death experiences or brushes with death, like the, you know, the lighter touch, they emerge. And when they realize, oh, good, I am in fact still alive. Mm -hmm. One of the key characteristics is they don't also give a shit. They don't care about the oh, things like what true? you described, email. It's, it's one of the most, so the number one sort of thing that comes up is that they get a reshuffling of their priorities. They all of a sudden realize like, oh my gosh, wait a second, whatever the priorities are. And again, there's no prescription. It could be I want to spend more time with my family. Or for some people, it's, I want to start that business. Or for some people, whatever it is, it's like, I know now with crystal clarity, my time's limited. I saw that it was almost taken away from me. So, oh, I'm going to get better about using it, my time the way I want. But part of that is also, it's like a little bit of a brushing away of the bullshit where they think, I, I don't care as much what people think of me. So I answer my emails because I care too much about what people think uh -huh. of me. I'm a pleaser. And that is not a great way to live comparatively. But can I ask you, how did you, did you have a brush with death in order to wake up I and did. say, I couldn't care less? I did. I did have a, a, a near death experience. I held my dad when he was dying and then I lost my son and recently lost my brother and sister uh, at the same time, a uh, sister-in-law, but I call her my sister. And, and, you know, there is definitely a recognition uh, in death uh, that what matters in life is not what we think is, is what matters in life at all. That, 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 that the things that really matter in life, that most of life in the modern world is imposed upon us, mm. right? And that, mm. if, that if I, you know, and, and I know it sounds really weird because I look at it from a mathematical point of view, that if I displease 22,000 people that sent me emails uh, uh, by saving myself the time to respond to emails and write a book that reaches 220,000 people, I have pleased more people than I displeased. <gasps> That's right? the favorite thing I've heard in a very long time. There, there is, there is a very. You have to look at it as currency, right? So every Monday, truly, is I. I, I normally use the concept of heartbeats. You, you were born with somewhere around four billion heartbeats. Okay, that's a much more granular unit than Mondays, if you think about it, because by the time you and I will finish this conversation, we will have spent somewhere around twenty-four thousand heartbeats or something like that. And 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 when you when you think about that, it you know it suddenly sh hits you how many heartbeats are slipping away, right? And 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 if, if you had if you had the ability to say, look. I can only use every heartbeat for one thing and one thing only. Should that be email? Should that be time with someone I love? Should that be an introduction and a connection to a new human that enriches me? Should it be, yes. uh, uh, you know, writing a book? Should it be, what should it be? Okay. And, and I, I have to admit, even when it comes to, so forget enjoying life, which is the topic we're talking about, but living life fully. Mm, which is also the topic we're talking about when you really think about it. Living life fully is not about uh, sitting in Sydney somewhere to surf, right? It is also about being productive and engaged, but productive and engaged after you think about what actually matters to be productive and engaged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I love your, that, that awareness I think is the part we often miss because then we're chasing something that feels elusive. You're talking about the granularity of the heartbeats, which is right at my alley, right? Because for many of us, we talk about how many years we have. That's why I've broken it down to the 4,000 Mondays. The heartbeats is even better. Um, and that does the thing like for you, if you've got 250 high quality energy Mondays, how do I want to spend my time? Correct. However you want to word it, right? Happy, fulfilled. But, and then, then the work is, okay, well, what would it take to have you prioritize and fill that time the, the very best way possible? And oftentimes it is doing the thing like, what do you want to do less of? Oh, so for example, wor like worrying about the emails or worrying about other people's, you know, saying yes to that committee, which is wasting my time or hanging out with that friend who's actually really kind of, I always feel de-energized when I'm done hanging out with that person, exactly. like eliminating that. And stuffing it with more of the stuff that we at least already know we love. Because those are the cues and clues I think our lives have already given us. Mm. It's like when I ask people, what makes you feel most alive? 
And usually, you know, deers and headlights. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> and then, okay, well, it's okay. We'll figure it out. And then you get it. And people, you know, it usually comes to us over time and we add to the list. And that's all that our responsibility is, I believe, is that once we get in tune with that thing that lights us up and it, and it can be from, for various motivations, right? It could be because you are motivated to help change the world. And so for you, it might be the act of writing. And it may also happen to be on the beach when you're done surfing for the morning, because maybe we can fit both in. Um, but identifying like, what is the thing that makes you feel really alive? And can I share something with you, Mo? There's something so, so funny about our human nature. Funny, unfunny. Many people, when they are asked, what is what is the, not just the thing, I think it's hard to have one only one thing, but what's a really big thing for you that makes you feel alive? When people come up with the answer to that, when asked, well, when was the last time you did it? <laughs> it's so remarkable because it's not that often. Yeah. Do you know? Like, can I ask, can I get nosy and ask you, what's what makes you feel super alive? Uh, time with someone I love. Uh, when was the last time I did it? Oh, actually, Aya was here last night. Yes, uh, I am. I am. My daughter was here last night. But but do I do it frequently enough? I, I again, I you know, part of my reflection was Aya and I used to have those wonderful experiences uh, where uh, when she lived in Montreal and I needed to get closer to her. So I, when I, when my son died, Ali. Uh, Ayaz, uh, Ali was such an amazing man. He so he was the masculine figure in her life, and uh, and and when when he died, it took me a few months. But then I very quickly recognized the gap, and I needed to get close to her. But she was a student in Montreal at the time, and you can imagine, you know, a, a high, you know, a university student doesn't want daddy to be around, and so I did this very interesting trick, probably the best thing I've ever done in my life. I swear, I if you ask me to, the best thing I've ever done. I started to, I, I used to work in California at that time and shuttle back and forth between California and Dubai. And I would pretend that I have work in Montreal and I would <laughs> stop. And yeah. So I would, I would stop in Montreal on the way and then text her after I land. Okay. And say, baby, I'm in Montreal for three days. And uh, if you have time, we can go shopping or have dinner together. Right. And then I would spend three days doing call because I have nothing to do in Montreal. I mean, lovely no city. client. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> lovely city, but not for me really. Anyway, and and then you know, normally on the third day, she would say, or "Go like, oh, you're still here. Let's go have uh, dinner or whatever." Okay. Uh, and we had so many of those lovely experiences. Of course, over time it evolved, right? So, so I uh, at first would go like, "Okay, okay, I'll text you," and then text me on day three. Then, you know, eventually she would start to text me on day two and say, let's go out shopping or whatever. And then, you know, after a while she would go like, why are you in a hotel at the other corner of the city? Come closer. Why don't you come to an, an Airbnb in my, in my apartment building? She then said four months later that the apartment on the other corner of her floor is empty. So I said, rent it and let's give it out for Airbnb. We never rented it for Airbnb. I just stayed there every time I landed. And the beauty was that she, uh, she would, she, so her kitchen window looked at my kitchen window. Okay. And you know, my coffee ritual. So I wake up in the morning, I'm making a coffee. And when I see that she woke up, I text her and I say, baby, I'm making pancakes and milkshake. Would you like to come over? And yeah, over time, uh, I got her back and, and I will tell you hands down hmm, that it is the absolute best thing I've ever done in my life. It's that, it's that attention, that constant attempt to not preach and say, I'm your dad, you should call me but to actually show up somehow. And the, the reason why I say this is because yesterday I was talking to Aya and I, and I was like, baby, why don't we go shopping anymore? And she, she and I both, we don't want clutter in our life. She said, because we, we don't want to buy things. And I said, yeah, but why don't we go shopping? You know, it doesn't really matter. It's the experience of walking together and you showing me, a, you know, a, a jacket and I say, oh, it's so lovely, put it on and so on and so forth. And that experience is one of the most l wonderful experiences I used to have with Aya. And I have not had that for like three, four years now. Uh, oh, I'm so moved. Everybody right now is just moved. This is, I love this so much 
creating a fake fake business fake in business. service <laughs> yeah. of yeah. a relationship and um creativity you gave a shit that i call that giving two shits about life like it was like you could have just said she is hey nice. let me come together yes so you see this is this is the point again i think you have what people don't recognize is that is what really matters okay and aya really matters this this is the whole point you know business matters and another uh, business venture matters and a big deal matters and you know writing or whatever matters but in all honesty what matters most i i love your idea of the list right if i if i were to ask people to write that joy list let's call it the joy list i would then ask them to rank it and say so rank it is right yeah yes. tell me the top 5 so I, I thanks for saying that. I think the ranking is important. I also think that it's important to I know some people that put it in an Excel spreadsheet and rank it according to how much time of commitment it might take them because uh -huh. some things are super quick <laughs> and some things yeah. have require you know like sometimes you only have five minutes between a meeting, right? Um, and I also think that sometimes those sweet, simple pleasures will be an example of what makes you feel most alive. i I also think for some people it's it's sort of a different different world. You know, because for some people, there's one gentleman I'll never forget. He was so clear. He's like, whitewater rafting. He's like, I can't explain it. And that's just always the funny thing. Is people always, always say, I can't explain to it. Do like, that. Okay. Well, you know, hey, that might be a thing for you based on that. Maybe, maybe this is your nudge. But this gentleman knew. He's like, I come alive in ways I can't explain. I'm like, you do not have to explain it. It's oh, clear. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but he he was living in a state where they were like, he, he only went whitewater rafting like every two years on vacation. And yeah. that's one of those things, like we all can see this, like that's a travesty to know that one of the things that makes you feel most alive in your limited 4,000 Mondays, like you're only going to get to do it like six more times in your life. Is that possible? Come on. And so it's orchestrating your life so you, you can just get to do a little more of what you love. So it sounds like with your daughter, I don't know, you might need to rig another, rig another trip of some sort in order to get that shopping going again. Although... It sounds like she's already sold. Yeah. You see, so, so the, the, the white water rafting example is really interesting because I, I went once in my life, uh, I was visiting Turkey and I don't know why I, they were like, oh, we're going to go white water rafting. And I was like, yeah, fine. And I freaking loved it. Uh, there was that element. Yeah, there was that element of flow where you really have to, you know, zoom in and choose, choose if you want to resist the, the river or if you want to flow with the river. Right. And, and that tiny bit of masculinity that has to die so that you flow with the river. Oh my God. It's <laughs> so enriching. It's so enriching mm. to, to suddenly say, no, 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 hold on. You know what? I'll surrender a little. Right. And I think that that was such an incredible experience for me. But, but yeah, I also told Aya that I will take her to every roller coaster in Europe. Uh, and I didn't. Maybe, did, are you listening, Aya? Uh, maybe <sighs> I could. <laughs> You've just created a start of a list. It doesn't need to be a list, but it's an example of what I call a pregret. And I know it's a super corny word that I've made up. It's it's, but it illustrates these are regrets in the making. So it's not quite a regret. <laughs> it's a, a pregret. Great like, term, right? Well, so you know, you're not sickly on your deathbed. You're looking quite alive to me and spry. And you've just said, I always said I was going to do that, as though you, as though the ship had sailed. When as far as like. You still have time. Then the question is, does the dream still don't, exist or do you want to edit it? Don't start me. <laughs> I mean, I could challenge you. We are all going to campaign. All your listeners are going to campaign right now to challenge you. It's the whitewater rafting or the roller coasters or both. You choose. Or or the or the van across, uh, uh, you know, across the world. H have you heard of that one? Across the oh. world? Yes. Why not? I'm I'm a creative. I don't have to be anywhere at any point in time. Tell me more about how we, how will you get the van around the world? We're not going to say that. We're not. We're not going to say that. We're not going to say people will get worried that I'll stop working. I'm not going to do that. No, but uh, you know, you know those very old VW vans. You know, I I restore cars all the time. I know my cars really well. I'm a very serious mechanic. So, hey, maybe make one of those and start driving. Who knows? Oh, the spot. So oh. I can record this podcast from the van. I just need a good. Uh, a uh, 5G connection or something. Totally. You can get that park outside any Starbucks. <laughs> no, no, no Starbucks. No Starbucks. Horrible coffee. Uh, no, I, well, did I just say that? Uh, 
they they do they do make a very good uh, Christmas blend. But uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your, your sponsorship isn't totally lost. They may still, they may still sponsor I'm, I'm you. I'm <laughs> never going to be sponsored by Starbucks. But, uh, but you know, I, the, 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 I told you, did you remember in the morning when I mentioned uh, my morning ritual for coffee? Yeah. Okay, th this podcast has just gone wrong. Yeah, let's but see. But not the Starbucks, not, not the coffee shop. So when you just described the van and other things, I notice a trend for people, whether you call it their bucket list item or just the thing they long to do, it's in stark juxtaposition to the really structured lives we live it's it involves usually some spontaneity and I'm very spontaneous. tell me that but, oh you are already yeah okay. i i think i think the very very core of me I, this is uh, just such a lovely chat you and i are, are there an, are there a few tens of thousands of people listening yeah it, it is the the thing about me is i'm an ultimate introvert i yeah. want my alone time me too. are you do not Big stay oh. Oh, big time. Okay. No when, don't way. you find you go, you go when you do a talk and it's like, everyone's like, Oh, he's such an extrovert. Cause we're on stage and we're chitty chatting. It's great. Da, da, da. And then all it's all I can do to do the, da, 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 you know, the, the socially required obligation stuff, which is also good in connecting. And I just want to go back to my hotel room, yeah. restore, recharge. Oh, you do not you come too? across as an introvert at all. No. Because I'm energized right now, and then if I was in person, especially, it would nobody nobody knows. I'm not trying to hide it. I'm truly energized, and then it's just a matter of recharging your batteries in a way that you know is usually quite long. Susan Cain, uh, have you read the book uh, Quiet? Yeah, I'll, that's the Bible of introverts. But, but so her her definition is that you. Um, you know, it, it's not, it's not social awkwardness. It's not feeling shy. It is that you recharge when you're alone or you recharge when you're with people. And, uh, and it's, and she's, she actually says that it, introverts recharge alone because they are highly attuned to every social and every emotional s uh, signal that comes their way. So when I'm with 4,000 people, uh, you know, and maybe a hundred of them come and speak to me afterwards, I'm in so much, putting so much energy to tune into every single one of them. By the way, one of my biggest joys in life is to, is to connect to a human. And, uh, and, uh, and as a result of that, that takes away energy and you have to go and go like, okay, door closed. I can now, you know, plug in and, and recharge the batteries. That's how it is. Yeah, exactly. I'll see you in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you coming right to the you. speaker's dinner? Uh, um, um, no, I have emails, wink, wink to answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we must never be quoted on this. No, exactly. no this is all, this is entirely off the record. And um, yeah, only but again, knowing what makes you tick, yeah. like knowing what makes you tick and what ticks you off, and that 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 sort of self awareness, I think, is all about the like coming up with your operating manual to live a livelier life. You know, so so many of us we do a little bit of that work so that we could be better leaders. Uh, that's the work I did for years, and it's just uh, you know, being a better parent those are all great things what about again tuning back into like what how will you feel like you led a wide life with vitality and a deep life with meaning at whatever dose and interval you need because not all of us need um a daily dose sometimes that would be exhausting let me just say of course if you guys are listening to this, uh, um, you know, it's different than if you're watching it on YouTube because Jody comes across as very lively and, you know, very uh, um, into life. But, you know, you may think that this means that living fully is a, a hedonist thing. It's not at all. Living fully is being true to your own uh, tuning, if you want, that what, 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 what you came to life to experience, right? If your tuning is you love intellectual conversations and you're not having enough of them, then that's it, that you're not living wide, you're not living fully. And I, I think that's really the core of what, uh, what we're talking about here. Jody, so tell me this, um, when, um, when, when you really look at society at large and, and the design of modern life, it's almost telling us that this is silly. We shouldn't be doing this. And in my analysis, it started with the industrial revolution. Uh, you know, I remember vividly when I started working at Google, uh, that, um, 
you know, Google, by definition, we really had a mission. We really wanted to do something amazing. And very quickly, you would notice Harvard Business Review writing articles that say, you see the young generation, they don't want to work for salaries. They want to work for a mission that they believe in. And suddenly every other company started to pop up and say, ah, here is our mission. Here's our mission. Here's our mission. Right. And, and, and it's quite interesting that there, there is almost in always a marketing job whether on our, in our personal lives, in our love lives, in our work lives, that tell us that there is a certain way to live, okay? And that every other way is a waste of your life. You're saying, of course, it's the opposite, that it, it, there is only one way that you specifically want to live and every other way that deviates from your way of living is a waste of life. Now, how do you resist that flood? How do you resist that hose of advertising that tells us we should live a certain way? Mm hmm. I, I think that sometimes it can be informative, right? So there are trends and you are really right about this whole notion about your work needs to be mission oriented in some way, shape or form, which, you know, I think um, opens up a dialogue in many ways about, wait, let me think a little bit about it. Am I feeling like my work is meaningful? And I will just take a quick sidebar to say, holy cow, I think there's way too much inordinate pressure that work has to be a source of meaning for you. And for many people, it's that um, we need to kind of recalibrate our relationship to it, make sure that we don't not like our work. You know, work cannot suck our souls out of our bodies, ideally. Um, but that might mean that we need to find meaning and uh, elsewhere, you know, like in other domains of life. And so I just want to put that little campaign in there for a second that um, sometimes the PR that's out there or the trend that's out there about how to live, they're just data points that I do think can help us shape us and say, okay, wait a sec. I hear all this stuff about, you know, post COVID of revenge travel and all these things that are going on. Am I supposed to be getting on a yacht? Am I supposed like what? And, and if you're true to yourself, and again, we're not living for the sake of someone else to, for optics so that it looks cool. Um, that's, it, it's, it's just helpful information potentially to say, wait a minute, do I really like where I, I'm a fan of diagnosing the dead zones. That's what I call it. It's like, look at your life in all the domains. Um, I have a, uh, easy 68 question assessment where I get people just to look at all the parts of your life that maybe where things are really feeling alive and where they're feeling flatlined. And sometimes we have to look at the flatlined areas and well, number one, if I wasn't a good positive psychology practitioner, I should definitely put a vote in for do more of the things that light you up. I mean, that's the fast track. That's fantastic. Do more of that stuff. Big bang there. And if you see that there's an area that is just totally dead inside, like maybe for you, it's like your social life. You're like, I just never really recovered after COVID. And I just kind of, I don't know. I know we, we used to go to brunch or we used to go for walks or whatever. You know, maybe that for you is that thing that creates that, um, that sense of if I did have maybe one more social thing in my life, maybe even just a month, what might that do for me? And I got to just give it a try. But so I do think that sometimes the prescriptions are, potentially helpful to say, do I want more of that or don't I? And we get to be really analytical and judicious because we can't fit it. We can't follow everyone's prescription and nor would they all be right for us. I think it's all just super customized. But the more you know yourself, the more you go back to your list about what makes me feel alive. And it'll evolve because as we grow, you might get really into whitewater rafting. And I'm going to talk to you this time next year and you'll be like, I killed the Nailed rafting. It. Yeah. All of the rapids have been rafted. <laughs> I am now on to rock climbing and, and there's nothing better. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So just keep getting into it's attunement is attunement to say, am I honestly just and I've never met a single soul who has ever kind of tapped out like, I'm doing it all. I've done it all. What's next? It's that there's usually a desire, especially for people who are really hoping to max out their potential or however you want to word it, that are just clamoring for, hey, you know what, I've done a lot of cool things. Now I'm thinking I am feeling like I might want to have a little more connection to spirituality, or now I'm thinking it's time for me to really get involved with my community, or now I've done all that stuff. It's super serious. I just want to go on a bender, like get, get, getting in touch with the thing that you need again, to feel like life's getting lived around here. And because just to reinforce the point on behalf of the Grim Reaper, because I am his PR rep, it's like, it ain't going to last forever. Maybe not, maybe it won't even last long. You know, mm. I mean, you've had a lot of loss. Um, and I, by the way, I admire the way you answered my question earlier about when you said like you had a near-death experience. I've never heard somebody talk about it with 
vicariously like your grief about losing loved ones and your son's been what 10 years now this year and he's now exactly this year it's going to be 10 uh 10 years in three months yeah okay so using the experience of loss of other people can be admittedly it's very layered and uh rife with emotion uh and it can also be the thing that makes you wake up and say I, 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 will, I will agree strongly. I mean, when you when they talk about near death experiences, and I, I as I said, I had one. Uh, the nearest I got to death is when Ali died, right? That's that's the truth huh? because I experienced the near death experience, but I came back. That's a very different. And you're absolutely right. I had two guests here on the podcast. One of my absolute f favorite episodes was uh, Pin van Lommel, who was a Dutch, I think, intensive care unit. Uh, doctor or something like that, who has actually documented hundreds or thousands of cases of near-death experiences. And, and one of the first things that he spoke about is the idea that when people come back, they lose all the fear, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they, mm -hmm. they start to feel fully, to live fully, they start to live meaningfully, they become more spiritual and many other things. This was a beautiful conversation. Uh, but, but, the, but the thing is that a near-death experience, when you go through it and come back, is very different than to lose the one that you love the most. Right. And, and, and I think that's the closest you get to the reality of the finality of death. Right. Uh, because when, when Ali left our world, uh, I was the chief business officer of Google X. I had a 25, 27 years career then that paid me for the one thing with, you know, that I did better, slightly better than others, which was to solve problems. Right. So if you, if you gave me a problem, you can sort of feel comfortable that it will be solved because I know how to solve everything. And then Ali leaves and I cannot solve that. There's absolutely nothing you can do to bring him back. And it's so interesting when you suddenly recognize, of course, my view, as I said, is very different than yours. My, my view is that within my thousand Mondays, uh, I will go and hug him and spank him for leaving early. Right. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, but, uh, but it is still, there is a finality of, I'm never gonna hug Ali in his physical form of that shape ever again, right? Right. And that finality yeah. suddenly, Habibi, when, uh, when, uh, when he left his mother, who's the kindest, most loving person ever, um, when he was flying to, uh, from Boston to come meet us, he texted her and said, are you going to fly me first class? Okay. And, and of course we flew him economy, right? And then I sent him some miles. So I think he upgraded or not, but I don't remember. But then she came back and said, why didn't we fly him first class? Right. We can afford to fly him first class. And why didn't we? And of course, as a father, I was basically telling my son, I don't fly first class myself, but I was telling my son, you know, anticipating that he's going to live forever, uh, that it's good for you to toughen up and to learn the value of money and, 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 and her, you, the mother's heart is like, why? Yeah. Yeah. In retrospect. Why, why did, why did we raise them, uh, for an eventuality that might never ever happen? Okay. Why don't we actually raise them to live and fully enjoy life, be responsible, mm -hmm. but live and mm -hmm. fully enjoy Oh, the poignancy of what you're talking about is just, I feel it. And you can't, I, I can't help but extrapolate what you're talking about then to our lives, which is the common royal we, which is that tension that exists between we, let's say we all had only a few years left. And if for some strange reason in a talk show from beyond, we could say, oh man, why didn't I get out there and get on that bus tour across the, all of the continents and do the things I want to do? And, uh, and of course, well, because we do still have, you know, responsibilities and we do have to budget in our minds for a bit of a longer life. So that's that tension of like to spend the money or save the money. Do mm -hmm. I live and go full out or do I be responsible because I might live until I'm 99? And, and at the end of the day, there's no perfect answer. There's no right answer, right? Like, just like you were raising Ali to recognize perhaps that not everything is available to you. And your wife, of course, in retrospect says, why didn't we just lavishly get, give, give, you know, give them everything. Yeah. Um, because there isn't a perfect answer, I guess, how do we want to treat our lives now? The knowing that they're finite, damn it. But knowing also that there's got to be that little bit of a balance of, 
Am I experiencing enough of it now, not deferring it for retirement? Because we all know the stories of people that wait till retirement and then they're not able-bodied or they don't have all their marbles or they don't, or they die. They don't even make it to retirement because that happens. Are we, are we living enough now to feel like, yeah, you know what? I mean, I, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm showing up. I'm playing to win. I'm taking, you know, I'm, I'm doing things that make me feel alive in the ways that I've decided are good for me. And I'm not irresponsible. I'm not draining the bank account or, you know, I, and so that is, that's the, that's the balancing act that we will hopefully have the distinct pleasure of trying to balance until the day we die. You, you know, my, my answer is always that uh, truly, if you want to live life fully, enjoy the economy flight. So, so, so just get on that flight that you got because some others don't even afford the flight, right? And, and, and live it fully and enjoy every bit of it. And then when they put the shitty meal in front of you, you know, there's always like one biscuit that you enjoy or whatever, you know, it's, it's really lovely in every possible way. And then, and then like you rightly said, if you have a list of joy, right? Uh, prioritize your top five. And if, if flying first class is one of them and it comes higher than learning how to be assertive with money, then do it. Don't, don't wait until you learn to be assertive with money. Can I, can I just ask you one last question? Because I know you have to, uh, to take your husband to the airport, uh, which I suggest you don't, but anyway, um, <laughs> We we speak from a place of privilege, right? So we talk about first class and we talk about, you know, white water rafting and not everyone lives that way. I think we live in a life now where there is so much stress. I think the economies everywhere in the world, America included, uh, you know, is, uh, there are lots of people who are suffering. How, how do you feel, live fully? How do you have a, you know, you extend your life to the widest you can when you don't have the means to? Yes, I love this question so much. You reminded me on Friday night, um, my husband and I saw a documentary here in Palm Springs in California. There's a documentary film festival. And one of the films, it was a very short one in a compilation, was about a war-torn area that had also experienced a pretty drastic um, earthquake, one after the other. And they were profiling these kids. And back to a childlike sense of wonder, right? These little kids had cameras and they were going around taking pictures of rocks and little tiny shoots of green that were coming out from in between the rocks and some of the rubble and each other laughing and, you know, someone making funny faces with his, you know, teeth and doing really like the back, back to the simplicity in which now maybe some naysayers are like, look, I'm not going to go out and take a picture of a rock. I might actually challenge you and say that, the consistently in research, it comes up that it is the cheap and cheerful, the sweet and simple, the simple pleasures about savoring back to the point you made about taking that coffee. Okay, some people may not even have enough money to rub together to get a coffee, but whatever your morning drink is, or your meal, or the companionship you have of the person beside you, no matter where you are in the world, there are clouds that you can look at and look at and wonder. Yeah. There is the joy of, of the um, of your imagination, or there's the joy of looking back on photos, if you happen to have some about remembering the times, because we can savor the past, we can savor the current moment, imagine that. And then of course, we can have something to look forward to. And even if it's something that is super, super seemingly simple and free, those are the finer things in life that um, will debunk this in a hurry, that the good life does not have to cost a dime. And we just need to be, we just need to tune into it. And say, what is here and what am I, what can I be grateful for? Not just that I'm alive, because of course that's always a good default answer. But at the end of the day, it can be, wow, I get to have this really simple meal with my friends in my hut. And we can look outside later at the stars and just be thankful that we are amongst a speck of all this, all the fabulous things that are alive right now. I, I, I will have to say, I think that's even more joyful than all of the joys that money can buy. I, I think when you're restricted on that, uh, but but the, but the precondition in my mind is that you have to understand that even if life is difficult and stressful, that choice to live joyfully is what enables you to um, to uh, to to actually become more productive, to become more successful, to achieve more. I, I was just chatting with my wonderful wife yesterday. Uh, you know, she she is a very 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 
committed therapist. She loves what she's doing. And before we got married, before before we met, we, we got married 48 days after we met. So that wasn't a big difference. Uh, but, you know, but before we met, she would work literally seven days a week. And, uh, and one of the things that I encouraged her to do was to spend more time, uh, you know, really enjoying downtime. And, and the weekend was a big part of that. And yesterday, you know, at the end of Sunday, she was basically saying, I was so productive. I, I, I did so many things that I normally wouldn't have done because I never gave myself, or I mean, during my career, I never gave myself the time to, to slow down and, 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 uh, and, you know, and, and give myself the joy of downtime. When you do, you become better at your work. You become more successful. You become more creative. You write more, you do more and so on and so forth. It's absolutely the mm -hmm. truth. Slow-mo. <laughs> Slow-mo it, it is. You said Jordi, it. You, ha you it. have to go. And I am so grateful that you joined me. This was a wonderful conversation. You're the best. You're the best. I'm oh, glad no, in all you. of our limited time and in our limited heartbeats, I'm glad I got to spend this chunk of them together with you. Yes, 100%. A, a very valuable investment of heartbeats uh, and very joyful investment of heartbeats. Uh, for, <laughs> all, for all of you listening, I've really enjoyed this. I hope you felt the energy that uh, Jody brings. Uh, and I really think that it is a topic that is worthy of your reflection. It is, you know, life is going to be stressful, but uh, the amount of joy that you bring into your life takes away that stress, makes you more productive, makes you able uh, to deal with the stress and become more resilient. So invest in yourself by doing that. Uh, again, uh, I will ask you to remember if you're interested in Unstressable, pre-order it now, please. And if you've enjoyed this episode, share it with others. Uh, and, and the answer is very clear. Uh, we're going to all uh, listen to what Jody told us, write a list of joy uh, and, uh, and basically prioritize them and include them in your life as you uh, see fit because I will remember this forever. The biggest fear that uh, rivals the fear of death is the fear of living. Take a little bit of time to slow down. It doesn't matter how busy you are this week. There's always a tiny bit of time to slow down. I love you all for listening and I will see you next time.